Okay, uh, I think I think we can get things started as people are joining. Um, I'll say hello. Uh, my name is Julia Shindorovic and I work as a senior lecturer at the Wolfson Center for Young People's Mental Health. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the first lecture series of this academic year for our lecture series. Um, for those of you who are here for the first time or have forgotten over the summer, this is a public lecture series. Um, so it will be recorded. In fact, it is already recorded and the recording will be posted on YouTube where you'll be able to see talks uh, from the previous months that you ha may have missed. And you're also most welcome to share uh, the recording with other people who can check it out on, on YouTube. Uh, the session is scheduled for an hour and the question and comments are very much encouraged. So please pose them in the Q&A box um, that you can hopefully see on your screens. And I'll keep an eye on this. And then following Dr. Simmons presentation, we'll have time for uh, questions and answers. Um, and as I already hinted, our speaker today is Dr. Eric Simmons, who you can hopefully see on your screens. Uh, he's joining us from Boston College. And Dr. Simmons is a postdoctoral research fellow and research statistician at the research program on children and adversity. Uh, his work draws on implementation science to scale evidence-based programs that aim to promote social justice and improve health, well-being, and overall experience of marginalized communities. So we are really pleased to have Dr. Simmons with us today to talk about his research in Rwanda. Uh, and uh, this will be focusing on a home visiting program designed to promote early childhood development and prevent family violence. So over to you, Eric. Thanks Thank so much. Thank you so much. I'm just gonna share my screen very quickly and we'll get going. Okay. Excellent. Well, I, I'd first like to thank the hosts for having me at the Wolfson Center. Um, and thank you all for joining uh, wherever you are in the world. It's the morning here on the East Coast in the United States, but whether you're in the UK or, or abroad, uh, a welcome. Uh, welcome to my talk. As mentioned, I'm Dr. Eric Simmons, uh, and, and this talk will be titled The Play Collaborative and Implementation Science Initiative to Expand the Reach and Quality of play-based, father-engaged, home visiting to promote early childhood development and prevent violence. And my sincerest apologies for the long-windedness of that title. We sure do have a way of making our titles uh, uh, excessively long uh, in my center. But hopefully you get all of that uh, and more out of this presentation. Um, so what we're gonna talk about here today See if we can get going. Yep, it is a few things. I'd first like to introduce my team, the the broad team we have that expands uh, across the world, really. Um, and a little bit of background of the areas we work in. Uh, I'm going to introduce the family strengthening intervention, uh, which is called Sugira Muyango in Rwanda, which translates directly to, to strong families. I'm going to talk a little about implementation science and its key role, uh, really the active ingredient on how we uh, accomplish so much of our scale and sustainment within our work. And then we'll talk about the specific implementation science strategy we use, which is called the play collaborative. I'll talk a little bit about an embedded trial we're using. Um, and then we'll go into some summary points and next steps before we open it up for questions. And what I really want us to take away from today is, is a little bit of the science, but also the story, because I think stories are memorable, uh, stories stick with people, and stories are some of the thematic elements that we'll take with us and use in our own lives and our own work. Um, and to help guide this story, I'd like us to start with a question. I want this to be our guiding question that sits across the entirety of this journey we're about to embark on during this presentation. And it sits here. Given the number of evidence-based programs that exist to promote early childhood development and mental health, why does it feel like the mental health crisis is as dire as ever? Uh, or, or put more simply, we can all conjure uh, an illustration depiction or an evidence-based program that we've seen in the news or we know works or per perhaps we've even researched in the past. Uh, given this, why are mental, mental health uh, it, rates skyrocketing in terms of crises uh, currently happening um, and, and so on? So I want that to sit uh, as the driving engine of our conversation here today. 
But before we get to that question, before we really uh, get moving and we understand why that might be happening and what we can do about it, I'd like to introduce my, my lab, uh, the research program on children and adversity uh, called RPCA for short. And there are a couple of things I really love about this lab. One, we work globally and we work with risk and resilience. We have a family-based approach rather than just caregivers or just children. Um, but we focus on capacities, not just deficits. So within our, our research curriculum, we don't just stop at saying we need to figure out why something is wrong. We focus a lot on solutions-oriented approaches. And the second thing I really enjoy about working with RPCA is the implementation focus of the work. So when we focus on, on implementation, we're saying not only can we identify evidence-based strategies, but what can we do to make sure that they're going to be scalable and sustainable, in particular with vulnerable communities within the US and abroad. And of course, I don't do this work alone. We, we have a lot of incredible and talented researchers and key personnel. We have teams for Boston College based in Boston that, that's in um, Boston, Massachusetts in the United States, as well as in Rwanda uh, based in Kigali. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that we also have a very, very vast team that expands beyond just our, our key, key infrastructure personnel we have field teams, we have district staff, we have village staff, we have people that work and volunteer across the various programming we have in our implementation sites um, in, in Rwanda, Sierra Leone, and in the United States currently working with refugee pop populations. So just to set the stage here and get a bit of context, there was a seminal piece written by Sa Sally Grantham McGregor, if, if nobody is fam familiar, she's one of the, the pioneers and trailblazers of early childhood development and particularly home visiting programs. And in this very well regarded, esteemed and highly cited Lancet issue, she had the premier piece stating that over 200 million children under five years are not fulfilling their developmental potential. They're falling behind on mental health outcomes. They're falling behind on, on life trajectory and developmental outcomes. And this is problematic for various reasons, notwithstanding that it contributes to poor quality of life, um, and it, it's bad collectively for communities and populations. Now, I know because I'm very vested in this literature that that number has actually been updated as of 2017 uh, to be approximately around 250 million. So we're going in the wrong direction, albeit the population is growing, but still we would wanna see those numbers reducing rather than increasing. And we see far too many of these children located in Sub-Saharan Africa um, who are failing to reach their developmental potential. In Rwanda specifically, which is where I do a lot of my work and where I'll be talking about a lot of our site work today, there are additional issues and challenges that, that the population is facing in terms of child and youth development, mental health outcomes, uh, as well as regular lifespan developmental outcomes. Um, that start, of course, early in childhood, two of which that we've identified as being crucial um, and as being debilitating when not addressed are poverty um, and violence. So with poverty, we see, especially in rural areas, we are seeing, um, as our graph depicts here, incredible rates of, of malnutrition, um, not hitting anthropometric milestones, which are those terms stunted, underweight, and, and wasted, up to 50% for the poorest children, which is really bad and doesn't set them up to be able to um, experience intergenerational growth uh, from, from parents to children and the generations to come, um, or to fully excel within their own lifespan and experience a high degree of well-being uh, and all those things that we all seek after uh, in, a, in a good life. Uh, secondly, we also see high rates of violence, especially for children. One thing that's incredibly detrimental to our development is being exposed to violence, especially very early on. And one of those figures that's very alarming to me is that 80.7% of children, two to four, uh, have been exposed to violent discipline. So we're, we're setting up children to, to be on a path where they might be perpetuating these cycles of violence um, or just, once again, not fulfilling their, their degree of developmental potential because of violent exposure early on in life. As we know, with lifespan development, I'm sure I don't need to mention it too extensively here, that our development and the outcomes that we see in regards to mental health, in regards to well-being, are nested within these concentric infrastructures of environments. And these start from very, very early on. They start from, from birth. Um, and we're especially reliant on these proximal environments 
uh, in the, the earliest stages of life as we're coming in and growing into our own, uh, own adults, own, own agents of change. Um, so we know that being able to address these different domains uh, and systems of influence on our development is incredibly crucial for positive life outcomes. So what do we do about that? Well, within our lab, we identified one solution, which is now a very well studied and, and evidence based active coaching and home visiting program for caregivers of children from birth to 36 months, which is three years old. Um, and a few of these things have, have developed as some of my favorite characteristics about this program. I'll talk a little bit about it uh, as it, it is a uh, ECD promotion program, as well as a, a violence reduction program. But some of the things that make it very special is it's incredibly flexible. So in terms of scheduling, if there are scheduling constraints for families or, or caregivers, we train our home visitors, which we'll talk about later on, um, to be incredibly flexible in the times that they can visit in terms of the family types of configurations. They're trained to integrate and layer with other services within social systems. Um, the content focuses on a wide range of caregiver capabilities, uh, as well as early childhood development needs. So it's, it's developed from the WHO Care for Child Development, um, which is a very, very robust nurturing care system uh, that they've set up. But it also focuses on things like conflict resolution, shared decision making, stress management. Um, and it focuses on father engagement as well. So not just to say we're going to focus on a single caregiver, but to deliver uh, to all caregivers. And this program has, has transformed, it's morphed over time, it's, it's evolved and configured to the needs of the target population that we work with. So it began over a decade ago as an intervention for families affected by HIV. But as the years have gone on and, and iterations have happened, we've gone through these quality improvement cycles to continue scaling the program and continue making subtle shifts and modifications to make it exactly what Rwanda said it needed at any given point in time, which has resulted in our current phase where we're currently looking at a, a rollout of up to nearly 10,000 households and an embedded trial, which will be the focus of our conversation today. But the evolution of the program has been um, an incredibly vital factor in making sure that the, the program is fit for purpose. Now I'm gonna stop there because this is where I think a lot of presentations take, take a turn and you know they'll start talking about methodologies, they'll start talking about results, but, but this is a story. And I think an important point of the story is to realize when you're at a bit of a crescendo or, or realize when you're at a, a tipping point. And despite being in a phase where we're currently rolling out um, to thousands of households within Rwanda, we know that the battle is only half over. And I say this because implementation of evidence-based programs is a minefield. For those unfamiliar with the finding, it, it came out a, a few years ago that it often takes up to 17 years for evidence-based practice uh, to be embedded into service as usual or to be uh, adopted as routine practice. And I'm sure many of us have heard stories where you can reflect on one of these things, where, for example, you train and then you hope that the program experts are able to deliver and you don't check back in. Or you have a program that has incredible clinical outcomes, but for whatever reason, you find it very difficult to find the resources to be able to actually go out and deliver uh, the program as intended. Or maybe you have a lot of turnover and you were reliant on a core group of individuals to be able to deliver that program. And the list goes on of all of these different mind minds that can derail progress and derail uh, a program that's very evidence-based and very robust in its clinical effectiveness from getting into, into service as usual. In our own work, we found many of these to be uh, incredibly, <laughs> incredibly intractable and very massive obstacles. Um, and I'll tell you how we've, we've kind of gone through the process of trying to identify solutions here. Um, but there, there have been some core challenges, right? Uh, affordability and cost efficiency doesn't just disappear um, because our trials go well. Uh, finding the existing services and networks that we can integrate in, points to and fear, are all about enabling environments, about the policies, about the change makers and the leaders. 
um, having the right partners and building local capacity so that as you have turnover, as people move on, the work sustains. Political will, political shifts, and political resource allocations are different with every generation. Um, so it's important that you're in, embedded in the system um, in a way where you're very interwoven and ingrained in their general practices. And then maintaining a local workforce is something that's incredibly crucial to be able to identify that there are people who can do the work. So how have we gone about, about addressing some of these issues and challenges? It's, it's something that we can't just look the other way on because if we opt to say we have an efficient program that's evidence-based um, and just hope that government officials, local community leaders and change makers will just take that on board and, and run with it is, is, is very optimistic, but it's not realistic. So we developed a multifaceted, multi-level implementation strategy that focuses and targets each level um, of local infrastructure, uh, public infrastructure that is, um, from local to national governments. And our play collaborative, what I mean by multi-level is it starts at the community level and builds up to, to government um, personnel and government infrastructure. And what we mean by multifaceted or multi-component is it has evidence-informed strategies from the implementation science literature, some of which are listed here. For example, some of my favorites is an expert seed team that sits at the nucleus and is a driving force for change adaptations we have to make, um, you know, agile pivots uh, for unforeseen circumstances like COVID. Um, we have a shared charter and mission, which is really important, is we, we co-design everything when you have local buy-in which of course makes the ownership or shifts the ownership, not only to us as the scientists and the people who are implementing, but also to um, local communities who know that this is important for their community. Um, quality improvement cycles and continuous training op opportunities are things that we do as the program is being implemented. We always have room to make adjustments rather than implement and watch or train and hope. Uh, these PDSA cycles are, are very evident, evidence-based and robust ways to make quality improvements during a cycle of implementation. Um, and then the use of technology. We're currently in the process of developing a digital dashboard to provide access to information, training materials, and content for many more. And this is all based on the EPIS framework. For those unfamiliar, EPIS, uh, the EPIS framework stands for Exploration, Preparation, Implementation, and Sustainment. It's a four-phase framework that guides the process of implementation, and it focuses on some of these contextual factors that are noted here. Outer context, inner context, bridging factors, and innovation factors. And all this is to say is, I think implementation science is very funny in that uh, there are various different models. One of the favorite sayings in the space is, uh, you know, implementation science is kind of like everybody owning a toothbrush where Everyone has one, everyone has their own model, everyone is identifying some of the same factors, but nobody wants to share. So everyone wants to have their own. Um, and in this case, it, it's relatively the same. We're talking about keeping in mind here the things that are going to consider outer context, things like uh, a political will, um, inner context, the, the local workforces, innovation factors, things like the digital the digital tools um, and PDSA cycles, and then bridging factors. So the things that, the glue, the, the organizations that keep everything together. So currently, as mentioned, we're currently rolling out um, to, to the most vulnerable families in Rwanda. They're, they're known as the Ubudehe family ones, and they're the, they're the lowest socioeconomic strata. Um, and we're focusing on districts in Nagoma, Nyanza, and Rubabu. Uh, you can see them highlighted on the map there on the side. We have an embedded study. It's an embedded hybrid type two trial. What that means is we are studying our clinical effectiveness outcomes um, as well as the implementation outcomes, right? We, we have a clinical um, trial previously, our clustered randomized control trial that happened a couple of years ago. We find that to be our best and, and most scientifically valid evidence. But as we're scaling, we also want to make sure that our outcomes are still aligning with what we've seen in the past. And then, of course, as I mentioned, we're trialing and building a dashboard currently to help synthesize information, to help make things more readily available to all of our stakeholders and beneficiary, beneficiaries asynchronously and immediately. Now, how do we reach um, the hardest to reach families? I think this is a very important slide um, because we didn't try to create a new network and system that existed uh, on its own. 
we integrated into existing networks and service provision, uh, the, the social security network that already existed within Rwanda. So as opposed to going out, doing our own sampling, finding our own population, setting up our own infrastructure, essentially of delivery, we said, well, let's take a pause here and see who is already focusing on reaching those who, who exist in extreme poverty, um, those who are already seeking to promote gender equity um, and who are already working to improve the social safety net. And let's, let's find the win-wins. Let's find those places where the synergies exist already and integrate in and then provide evidence-based uh, means to improve things that we all find to be uh, you know, sufficiently appropriate and important for the development of the country. And that's what we did. So we partnered with uh, the VUP program in Rwanda, which is their flagship social protection program to help us locate our, our target families. Um, and then we brought our network to the party. We said, we know, um, and this is very important for us as scientists, that this work can't be done alone. There are certain things that scientists are incredibly good at and certain things we're not so great at. So we knew that we would need uh, re representation and input from district and sector level public officials. We knew we needed national level engagement to find that political will to motivate and galvanize the support of those who had control over the resources. We knew we needed an implementing agency. Um, and we knew we needed uh, also experts in the field in Rwanda. And I think this is an incredibly important slide to represent that while the program, evidence-based as it may be, sits at the nucleus of what we're doing, really it's the stakeholder ecosystem that guarantees the work is capable of being done. And I think that's incredibly important and something that we should all recall as we move forward. Now, keeping these networks together is an entirely different story. It can be incredibly difficult to do. So what we've, do, what we've done is we've set up what we call play collaborative meetings um, that create a community of practice. So there's spaces where our experts, um, all the way from the village level, where we have our friends of the family workforce, who, who I will talk about in a little bit because they're, they're crucial um, to the work uh, being accomplished, all the way up to the national level. And we have all of these individuals come to a shared space where they can problem solve together. They can use evidence-based tools like impact effort matrix, root cause analysis, five wise uh, problem solving tactics to share their experiences, learn from each other, uh, and strengthen the intervention oversight. So they're also receiving supervision, receiving um, additional trainings, um, and then interacting with other services, creating referral systems. Um, it's been crazy some of the things that have come out uh, uh, from just having that shared space of contact where individuals who are working on this program end up helping create clean water sources for, for communities or, or start savings groups, for example, just by being able to share space together. Uh, one of the emergent properties that I think is really special about the program and implementation strategies in general. And I'd like to talk about the people who are doing this. So these are, these are our community-based lay workers. Um, workforces are a thing that are, are a big topic matter right now um, in the mental health space, as well as, um, in the ECD home visiting space and, and any behavioral intervention space to, to be quite uh, frank about it, because we know that we need more support to support lifespan development, to support mental health, um, but we're just not producing uh, enough indiv individuals with, let's say the more formal credentials uh, and credential system level qualifications. So what's been happening a lot lately as of late has been the, the process of task sharing where experts can go through and train uh, community-based lay workers or community health workers. Um, we have a pretty extensive and intensive criteria. I don't know if I went through um, as, as intensive of this process to be hired for my job, um, but matching criteria members of the community, going through a three-tiered base uh, selection process, and then a 10-day training to identify individuals who are identified by their peers as already instrumental in community functioning, um, and, and that's where we found some of our, our biggest gains is having people embedded in the community who know the community are there. So what we found is our average age of the, we call them IZUs uh, for short, um, friends of the family is the translation there. Average age is about 44, 70% have completed primary school, but you know, not many have gone much further to secondary school or, or tertiary school, completed technical or vocation, vocational education. And then, um, we have a good gender balance of about 
Just a little bit more on our IZUs. Uh, they do a lot of roles in the community, so they don't just deliver this program, 18% uh, of which report having two or three roles, but we, we really focus on workload burden just as much as we focus on what the, what the ICU is, is doing or what's expected from their programmatic delivery. We don't want to overwhelm them because they are volunteers. So we try to make sure that they have under four household assignments that they'll visit. Um, and we don't really ever want to exceed five. But the ICUs do a lot for these families. Not, not only are they holding community roles, not only are they delivering our particular intervention, but as mentioned, they also function as kind of an integration or a layering of services where they're providing referrals for families uh, to do to, to receive other, other services that are avail available to them within the, the social safety net. Um, with 50% of the families within our, our programming receiving at least one referral during the intervention for things around health insurance, family planning, safety toilets, um, and, and much, much more. These are, these are three of our, our most prominent examples. Um, and we also train them to detect risk of harm. So things related to suicidality, family violence, um, uh, untreated illnesses, unsupported disabilities, and, and so much more um, in, in the COVID era we're currently experiencing also to support COVID cases, but they're trained to then pass those along to relevant uh, authorities or experts who can, who can help the families beyond the extent of our own programming. So our implementation strategy serves not only as a process for us to be able to scale and sustain, but also a hub where we can direct families to the resources they need to thrive. I'm going to talk a little bit about the data from what we're currently working on now in the embedded trial. Now, I will provide a caveat here uh, as we get into our, our final phase of this presentation. I am not currently at liberty to share all of our findings. We're currently in a process of sharing these with the Rwandan government for validation. And then after that, we're able to do more rigorous and robust um, dissemination of our findings. But there are some things I can share with you that we've shared previously. Um, and, and I'd like to start with our reach and retention for what we've currently done with our play collaborative. So our play collaborative strategy has allowed us to train 6,285 local officials and engage with 15,351 uh, government officials. So one thing I haven't mentioned about the play collaborative is not only are the meetings a space to receive supervision, extra training, problem solve with your peers, but we also invite government officials who have absolutely nothing to do with the program uh, to come receive a single day ECD training or come sit in or come talk to individuals who are delivering the program to see what their constituents are currently uh, facing, some of the problems that are happening um, and how they might align those with what are called their Imahigo goals, um, which are just the key performance indicators for the government. So. Once again, we use this space as, as an inviting collaborative space for not only our program related uh, and programmatic delivery, um, but also individuals within the community who are making decisions, key local players who might want to come and receive training on ECD or might just want a space to share and problem solve with their peers. In terms of reach and retention for families, we have pretty excellent um, retention rates. We've delivered, we've trained 2,608 uh, ICUs. Once again, those are the friends of the family workforce. So those are the individuals going out and doing home visiting. Uh, our, our current programming has reached 9,483 children um, and 19,548 caregivers, which to me, I mean, those are, those are astronomical numbers and, and we're very proud of that. But what's even more uh, exciting to us is what we're seeing as being capable when you use an implementation strategy uh, to retain the households that you have. So as we see in this figure here, not a lot of drop off in terms of individuals who start the program, receive our 12 modules, which it's a three month program. So you get one module per week, uh, the home visitor coming to you and delivering, um, but also receiving the three month and the six month booster. Lots of families are getting that. So they're getting a very long span of content and delivery from our program. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the measurements we've had. I'm not going to read through everything we measure. What I can say is we have a very, very long, um, extensive battery of instruments that we use. We measure information and we take observations from the caregiver on everything from their mental health status um, to the decision making and how they share it, uh, as well as uh, intimate partner violence, 
um, and more. And then for children, we collect information on anthropometrics, cognitive development, um, the interactions they have with their parents, as well as harsh childhood discipline and, and even dietary diversity. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of these findings, but given that it's a hybrid type two trial, we also collect about a lot of information on dissemination and implementation. And we have a, a very structured way of going about this where we collect information from our workforce, but we also collect information from the implementing agency as well as government officials to really make sure that we're getting a, a triangulated and very global view of how various different members of that stakeholder ecosystem are viewing the program. And this battery is drawn from the, the NIH, so the National, National Institute of Health in the United States. Uh, they have a common core dissemination and implementation battery that, that's been used by various programs. And we pull from that to develop our own slightly adapted and modified for the context uh, we're currently experiencing. Just to talk about our sample, once again, I know I've said that our program is currently reaching nearly 10,000 households, but th that's not the embedded trial. The embedded trial is a lot smaller. We're just checking um, to make sure that our clinical outcomes are staying consistent with previous trials. Um, and to state that is to say something important to say that, that this trial is important. Um, it's, it is a, a portion of what we're looking at, but we're also looking at the, the efficacy and effectiveness of the implementation strategy. Um, just as much as, as we're looking at the clinical outcomes here. Uh, we use a cluster randomized control structure. We, we analyze our data using um, multi-clustered, multi-level um, models. Um, so I'll talk about those findings in a second, but I want to take a second to, to pause on the demographics because that's important. Once again, I want us to know that these are very formal or vulnerable populations. Therefore, we do have a large percentage of, of individuals who have only completed primary school um, who, who can't read or can't write, which has, of course, impacted the way we design how our program is delivered being appropriate for our beneficiaries. And of course, having them in the process of co-design the entire time, participatory approaches are critical for the success of the work we do. I'm going to start with the DNI findings because as an implementation scientist, this has been one of the most complicated problems that I've yet to crack um, in, in my years of research here is it is very difficult to get individuals to offer what I'll, I'll put very politely as variants around um, what they think of the program. So we use this very well, well-respected um, and commonly uh, common core use implementation battery. And what we see on a scale from one to four is everybody seems to love everything about our programs. Um, we measure so many different things in terms of what participants think about how the program has been adopted. Do they think that it's, it's acceptable for their, their communities and their populations, appropriate, feasibility, you name it. We collect so many different things around uh, our, our implementation factors um, and implementation constructs that we know to be important for, for their success and sustainability, but are really, really difficult to actually measure um, true thoughts of. So we use qual we do use mixed methods approach. So we have qualitative information as well to inform this that we're still analyzing. But in terms of our qualitative, it tells a really good story here. Everyone seems to love everything. It's just difficult to model anything off of this because of course, all of our, all of our measurements have ceiling effects. So what I would say about our current DNI status and findings is that everyone absolutely says they're, they're enthralled with the program and they can't get enough of it. Whether that's true or not, only time will tell. Um, another thing that I find to be really efficient, what we have here is our coefficient in the, in the corner and a graph representing it above of our condition. So treatment versus control and time point from before the intervention to after intervention, coefficient, beta, effect, whatever we want to call it. Um, but what we're looking at here is for the home observation for measurement of the environment. One of my absolute favorite instruments that we use. What happens is a third party or external observer, enumerator, researcher comes into the home of a caregiver um, and looks to see what's going on in the environment that's going to be able to stimulate and support uh, cognitive and anthropometric development. And it has a whole bunch of subscales here, but what we're finding is that caregivers who receive the program are making more environmental mo modifications to their home to enrich uh, the development of their children. And this can come in the form of, in our particular case, uh, learning materials. So uh, SM caregivers 
have been observed to have more learning materials in their home, like toys and books, um, as well as involvement. So caregivers who are receiving the program in comparison to a control are more involved with their children and the activities of their children while they're in the home than, than individuals, caregivers who are not receiving SM. Male engagement, we purport to be a male engagement and, and gender equitable program. So it's important that we measure that. And there are two findings that we found from pre to post that support this information that we're doing a decent job of, of targeting um, all caregivers rather than particularly mothers, which, which a lot of programs tend to do. Um, on average, male caregivers participate in nine of 12 sessions and the medium for male caregiver participation is 11 sessions, which which is very rare and very high in comparison to other programs, which tend to just see uh, either one caregiver present or very low uh, rates of participation from, from male caregivers. Um, and secondly, on top of that, we find here in caretaking activities and shared decision-making, which is the, the graph on the side there, the effect, we see that fathers uh, tend to be more engaged in caretaking activities when they receive um, SM than when they do not. So they're engaged at that post there in about one additional caretaking activity um, than individuals in our control, control group, which is crucial that all caregivers play a role in child rearing. Uh, father engagement is, is absolutely vital to the advancement of gender equity in these spaces. So it's important that we're focusing not just on a specific caregiver, but all caregivers who are involved in child rearing. And that can involve uh, grandparents, aunts and uncles, anything that a family consists of. Dietary diversity. Now, what I will mention is we're not seeing effects on anthropometrics, which isn't entirely surprising. Given that we have a three-month program, I would be a little bit alarmed if we were seeing massive anthropometric differences between children in the treatment and control, especially given that we're also not giving out uh, supplementation for nutrition. Um, our programming do doesn't do that, doesn't include that. But we are see, seeing that caregivers who receive the SM intervention are providing their children with more diverse diets, which may lead to, if we can circle back to the very beginning context, less of those anthropometric and physical delays, such as stunting, wasting, and being underweight, um, and create increases in cognitive development down the road, because we know that that nutritional availability and dietary diversity are a key to developing not only your body, but also your brain. And as a final note here, caregiver mental health, um, I, I know that's important to this community uh, that I am speaking to today. So caregiver mental health is, is incredibly important too for the, the success uh, and the overall well-being of the program and the populations that we work with. And what we're observing is once again, a decrease. We're, we're seeing an overall decrease between both control and treatment, but, but the de decrease is steeper um, for those who have received SM. I think this is a particularly impressive fi finding given that our programming actually doesn't factor in mental health. We don't claim to be a mental health program. Um, we claim to be father engaged, early childhood development, violence reduction, but we don't claim to be a mental health program. So the fact that we're seeing significant decreases for mental health symptoms uh, measured using the Hopton, Hopton, Hopkins symptoms checklist, sorry, uh, is incredibly impressive. And I think this may be due to things like social support of a home visitor, you know, making improvements to your caregiver capabilities um, and communication and or self-care skills. And then just feeling that you have higher self-efficacy as a caregiver and family member. Th those are all uh, remarkably important details to, to improving um, not only your ability as a, a caregiver, but also as someone in a, a relationship or, or as a family member, um, and using those skills to make your life better, uh, whether that be in your vocation or just as a community member. So to close out here before I open up, I, I want to focus on some summary points and next steps and circle back around to our, our main question there that we started with that that's helped us tell this story around the program, how it's evolved, how it's developed, and how it's currently implemented. And my three summary points are that Sugita Mayango is an effective home visiting intervention. Years of trials have, have uh, given evidence to and provided and suggested that this is a clinically sound intervention um, to help vulnerable families in different countries. 
the second point here is to scale SM and other evidence-based programs, clinical effectiveness trials are not enough. And that's what I want to take as our key point. If there's one thing you recall today, it's that clinical effectiveness from trials are not enough. You also need implementation strategies. They are just as instrumental and just as valuable as those initial RCTs and initial pilot trials that you do to develop the evidence base to say that what you have is effective. If you don't have the implementation strategy, your program is doomed to fail or is at least subject to the whims of the universe and whatever chance may fall. Um, and then finally, the Play Collaborative offers a solution to scale and sustain SM. So by focusing on an evidence-informed, multi-component and multi-level implementation strategy, we don't guarantee that will scale and sustain, but we drastically increase our chances and we give ourselves a shot to continue delivering SM to the communities that we work with. So for our next steps, we have a couple of things we're doing. As I mentioned, we're validating uh, our findings by the Rwandan government so we can do more dissemination events like this um, and hopefully talk more and have those conversations about how we can embed and integrate ourselves with the Rwandan government. Um, we're monitoring longitudinal effects. So I did mention a a clustered randomized control trial that took place about three years ago. Uh, we are now looking at the effects of that longitudinally and looking at the effects and spillover that our program has on siblings who are in the household uh, while the program was being delivered, but didn't necessarily receive the initial benefits. And then we're going to continue grappling with the core challenges of implementation because that's necessary and it's never ending. It's a perpetual cycle. Um, it happens for every program. Solving it once doesn't necessarily mean that it's solved forever. Um, and I, I'm not saying that we all have all the answers. And I think it's important that all of us as people who care, um, people who work with vulnerable populations, focus not only on how can we develop our best programs and tools, but how can we get these tools to the populations that need them. And with that, I would say thank you um, and turn it over for questions and discussion. Thank you so much, Eric. Uh, this is an incredibly rich presentation that I think uh, we've learned so much about the work all the way from program development to implementation and scale up to thinking about measurement really rigorously. Uh, I'm especially impressed by the home observations. I can't imagine that was very easy. <laughs> <laughs> no. And then other ways to pull off. Um, I just want, I want to encourage everybody to post your questions in the Q&A box, or if you cannot find the Q&A box, you can also pop them in the chat. We are keeping an eye on both of them. Um, and uh, while people are thinking of their questions, perhaps uh, I'll ask the first one. Um, and uh, it's kind of hard to choose because there's so many interesting topics. But one thing I wanted uh, to ask you is um, um, there is this really um, uh, interesting um, fact you mentioned about the um, healthcare workers uh, who deliver the, the program and all the other things they do. And that's, an, I think, uh, often uh, as uh, implementation researchers working with evidence based programs, we work with an intervention. And then we're thinking about ways um, in, to integrate it with existing services and find those win-wins, um, as you put it. Uh, and there is this um, kind of balance in terms of thinking about individual interventions and people's capacity to deliver these interventions and balancing this with health system strengthening and uh, this kind of um, uh, professional capacity development. That's why there's an, a specific intervention. Uh, and there are all these ideas about evidence-based skills or components. So I was just wondering if, if uh, you've been thinking about this in, in your work in Rwanda and if you have any thoughts to share. Oh, absolutely. Um, and, and you've hit on all of the key points there that I think are super important in balancing all these things because we know that there is a uh, resource precariousness and a delicate balance of resources that that unfortunately just e exist, right? I wish it weren't the case because in the perfect optimal world, more is more, right? We could 
improve access to professional qualifications. We could continue to expand the task sharing and community-based health workforce um, while also doing the system strengthening. But in certain instances, we know that triage is important and be able to identify priorities um, is incredibly crucial. So in our own work, we focus primarily on the, the system strengthening as well as the workforce. While I think the qualifications point for the professional workforce is really interesting, it presents also the most obstacles and barriers. So we're going with the path of least resistance here. Um, firstly, the, the system strengthening. I put that as the number one. If you can strengthen the system, uh, flood it with a few more resources, um, and also create easy, accessible pathways for community workers to become involved or become volunteers or to learn these additional skills that may pay dividends down their line of their career. Um, so once again, not only offering the win-win for our integration strategy, but offer, offering a win-win agreement with our workforce um, via the benefits they get by the system strengthened, uh, that, that to us is very important. But then looking at workforce burden, we take a duty of care approach rather than anything else. So we say, how is this adding value to your life? And how are we making sure that we are looking after you as you're doing this, this work that um, is, is we know it's beneficial for the communities, um, but we don't want to be taking advantage of our workforce, which I know is, it, it can feel easy to do and be hard to miss um, of just saying, okay, well, you know, just take on a couple more houses. And, and we try our best to keep, to keep a cap, to keep a maximum, um, to guarantee that that's not happening. So our first goal is to strengthen the system, to provide it with more support, resources, as well as value add to our workforce. Our second is the duty of care, not to overwhelm our workforce and make sure whatever, are doing, whatever we are doing is offering value to their life and career trajectory. Thanks so much. Uh, that's, that's really fascinating. And I think it's uh, um, also a little bit of a gap in the literature in terms of systematically measuring those effects on people who deliver programs and services. Absolutely. We actually have a very brilliant PhD student who is seeking to fill that gap over the next two years. She, uh, she is looking at um, the, our particular ISU workforce and how they're programming, how they're training, how their delivery, um, what impacts it has across various different things, you know, not their mental health, but also um, their vocational skills and training, and also, you know, their retention and sustainment within their volunteer workforces. Because I, I don't know, maybe you all have heard this story in the programs you work with too, but I, I've heard many where uh, individuals volunteer for these programs, and then you go back in six months time and ask them, oh, you know, you remember giving that that program, what, what did that mean to you? Would you learn from it or using any of these skills today? And they go, wait, wait a second, what, what program are you talking about again? And then it, it kind of, you know, it, it begs the reflection of what are we doing with these volunteer workforces if they they can't take anything away with them and what they're doing isn't memorable enough uh, to, to stick with them for six months time, um, if not longer. So we're trying to fix that problem and understand some of the, the underlying psychosocial models that are driving that. Thank you. Yeah, and I think it's, uh, it's, it's so important. And of course, uh, with volunteer workforce, like any workforce, uh, we have the question of sustainability and retention, which I think you mentioned in terms of how long will people be actually doing it beyond the original cycle of program delivery? Right, 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 exactly. So also understanding uh, time spans and timelines is, is essential to the understanding of the work because just taking the assumption that whatever's happening is happening forever um, is a surefire way just to not be able to adequately or sufficiently plan for the next steps and phases. So what I consider our work to currently be in is this once again, I call it a crescendo point or this, this middle ground or no man's land where we could go very big and be in, ingrained as just a social service that's business as usual, or this could fade and kind of be you know relegated or relinquished to things that consistently have to chase cycles of funding. So understanding that for our program delivery, but also for the workforces we work with um, is, is an incredibly important topic to to keep in focus as we move on, time timelines and and resource availabilities and, and all the things that come uh, encapsulated in that. Thanks so much, Eric. Um, do we have any any other questions from the audience? 
Uh, you, you can post them in the chat or in the Q&A box. Um, it's the first session of the year, of the academic year. I think people are being extra shy, perhaps. Shy and getting in the groove, I certainly understand. Um, we, I, I see um, among, among the attendees that we have um, some colleagues that have worked uh, on the topic of father engagement, and I know that's something you have mentioned. Uh, and it's, of course, a, a big, um, in, in terms of father engagement and intervention, in terms of wider gender equity issues, a really big topic, I think, for any program or service that interacts with families and beyond. Um, so I was wondering if, if, if there are, are any best practices that uh, you have found in, in your work in Rwanda in terms of engaging men and male caregivers and making them feel welcome in this domain, which is often, they're, they're not always welcome or uh, coming to as easily. Absolutely. The flexible scheduling. Number one, that's my go-to solution. That has been the, I rarely, I mean, I, as you know, rarely say this in our work, that's been the silver bullet for father engagement, because what it does is you have the home visitor there and by bringing the father or male caregiver into the conversation of saying, oh, I can come whenever you're available, almost sets, sets the, the expectation or the ownership of responsibility for that male care, caregiver of, oh, well, they're coming when I'm specifically going to be there. Um, I, I'm not just going to sit on the side for the session. I, I'm going to be engaged in the session. So by setting that and, and doing that every session to say, when is everyone available? rather than, oh, I'm coming at this time. Can you just make sure that somebody's there? Uh, we, we found initially that without the flexible scheduling, the home visitor would show up and it would just be the mother or the female caregiver and the male caregiver, oh, well, he's off doing something or he's off at work. Whereas the flexible scheduling allows it so that you have the, the social commitment to your home visitor, um, to, to your partner, um, to whatever the the section of caregivers might, you know, might be or whatever the configuration might look like that they, they are going to show up and they're going to be there and everyone's going to participate because we're coming at a time that's the, the most uh, available for, for all. And of course, we know that conflicting obligations are one of the biggest reasons people cite at least for, for not being able to attend a lot of services, which um, particularly um, is, is, of course, a socioeconomic issue often people who cannot afford to miss work and absolutely and I'd say I'd say that that's one of those most general generalizable things um I see about the current work that we do home visiting is very resource intensive and I'm, I'm not going to try to paint that in a light that's that's any any deviation from the truth it's just a very difficult thing to sustain however I even see with light touch uh you know mental health or developmental interventions is conflicting priorities, resource demands, time, you know, time and resource demands as being one of the core things that obstructs um, individuals or groups involvement within mental health, evidence-based mental health or, or developmental programs. So the one thing I think is a big takeaway um, and an important point that we can keep in mind about things like this is by not just seeking to front load the advantages and values of programs, but saying, here's what we can offload or reduce the burden for or, or take away to make this easier to access. So focusing on removing barriers just as much as contributing drivers is something I take away from this, this program and the system by which we've created um, of delivery is, is barriers are usually they're the toughest things to get over. You know, we, we can find the evidence of what works time and time again through trials. Um, but yeah, that that focus on how we can make this easy and accessible and deal with some of the things that might be blocking those who are vulnerable or in low socioeconomic status um, positions is, is just as important. So I think that's an excellent point. Right. And I suppose in, in some ways, we, we it's, it feels like sometimes we have to recognize that we know certain things are probably helpful, like coming to people or helping them with transport, and that does carry an extra cost. Um, but that is the way to increase access. Absolutely, absolutely, and that's one of our, that's one of our biggest things currently that we're dealing with is is even for the the caregivers. Of course, I said the flexible scheduling, but of course, having a home visitor also sits nested within that explanation. 
is you don't have to go anywhere. You just have to be at home um, and someone comes to you. What we are finding with our workforce is that uh, transportation is a big thing. So even in sustaining our workforce, being able to provide them with the resources they need to get to the homes, um, get to these play collaborative meetings where they're coming together with their colleagues and peers um, to discuss you know, problems and, and to create that knowledge sharing experience. That also matters too. So as you're alluding to here, and it's super crucial, is just making sure that the resources fit the needs of the workforce and the caregivers at hand, and they're making it as easy as possible for everyone to do what we're saying is, is core practice, which is the program and program delivery. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, so this is a last call for any questions from the audience, but meanwhile, I'll just remind everybody that um, the video from today's talk and from previous talk talks uh, is on the Wolfson Center YouTube channel. Um, oh, and Catherine is um, also just sharing the information for the next um, uh, event of the series, which is on the 9th of November, and we'll hear from Professor Sarah Skin um, at Stellenbosch University in South Africa on helping adolescents thrive, uh, which relates to the recent World Health Organization guidelines for adolescent mental health. And we have also the link for the Wolfson Center mailing list. And a thank you to you, Eric, from, from the audience for your talk um, and for answering the questions. So a few thank yous here. Um, and hopefully everybody can see the links. If not, get in touch with us for further information. And um, on, on behalf of, of the Wolf Center for Young People Mental Health, thank you so much for your time and for sharing the experiences from, from your work, Eric. And we look forward uh, to keeping in touch and following your work. And all those findings that you have mentioned are in the pipeline. Uh, you have us hooked, so we'll be, we'll, be, we'll be waiting. And a few more thank yous are coming in into the chat. Um, so thank you so, so much, everybody. And I think, um, uh, Eric, is there anything you would like to share? Any closing thoughts? Anywhere you would like people to follow you? Uh, and my only closing thoughts is, of course, thank, thank you all so much for having me. Uh, I'm very passionate about this work, passionate to be able to share it. So thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, visit the RPCA website, which I believe was shared in the chat. Of course, subscribe to, the, to all of the Wolfson content. They, they do an incredible job. Um, and you can find me on Twitter at Eric Simmons6. Um, or on this YouTube talk, I'm sure some of my details will be at the end there uh, with my email as well. So that's it.